So we're back for the extra content. Behind the scenes. Um, Kingdom Hearts Part 2. Kingdom Hearts Part 2. Is this like a second video? What happens when Final Fantasy style characters are thrust into the Disney universe? You get a new action RPG game called Kingdom Hearts. If you saw our story last month, you learned how these two heavyweights, Disney and Square, came together to seamlessly blend the two worlds. This month, we're going to dive deeper into the gameplay and explore this immersive new action RPG. In the beginning of the game, Sora starts his journey from his home, while at the same time Donald and Goofy begin their journey. The three meet in Travis Town and travel to different Disney worlds, including Aladdin, The Little Mermaid, and The Nightmare Before Christmas. Since each of the game's worlds are so different, we figured that everyone involved in the game had a favorite. My favorite is the Nightmare Before Christmas world. It has a more unique look than the others. The rest of the game is made using animation cells, but the Nightmare world is made from actual photographs. We achieved an interesting look with combinations of the 3D game world and real photos. I'm really pleased with the results. I think the Peter Pan and Aladdin worlds are very interesting. Especially the mothership fight in the Peter Pan world. I definitely like the Nightmare Before Christmas art style look uh, better than I do the rest of what I'm seeing in this game. So, Kyrie's home is out there somewhere, right? So, just more interesting, yeah? Could be. My favorite is Destiny Island, because when I designed it, I wanted to get away from work and go to a tropical island. This island looks very relaxing. At the same time, this world contains many keys that help you solve problems. Oh, there's Waka. It's a very ah, is that, um, Selfie? Oh yeah, I'm seeing more of the Final Fantasy characters in this than I did in the trailer. One of the main items Sora will carry is the Keyblade. It is not only a weapon to defeat enemies, but it has a symbolic purpose of locking the door to each world. Four eleven. The Keyblade's appearance and abilities change depending on what kind of chain is attached. These key chains alter Sora's attacking ability in different ways. For example, one of them will raise Sora's attacking ability while at the same time drastically reducing his magic points. Yeah, that's not particularly creative. Oh, was that uh, Yuffie? Not a traditional RPG. Gamers will definitely recognize several elements from the famed RPG series. Well, since the core staff of this game has worked on Final Fantasy games in the past, we thought it was about time we try something different. I like RPGs because they're a game that players get deeply involved in. Sometimes RPGs have a hard time including action elements into the game. So we incorporated lots of action into Kingdom Hearts to the point where some may call it an action game. Like Final Fantasy, this game also has experience points. The difference is that you can earn experience points during battles, whereas you earn them after you finish each battle in Final Fantasy. For example, if you dodge an enemy's attack, you earn You're beating the shit out of Waka. <laughs> I might play this just for that. <laughs> Since action is heavily incorporated into this game, a skilled action game player may move up to different stages without having a substantial amount of experience points normally needed to move up. Some characters from the Final Fantasy series that will appear are Titus, Waka, Sophie, Yuffie, Sid, Mog, Sid, Cloud, uh, there's Squall, Cloud, Eris, uh... I don't know who the hell that's supposed to be. In all of Square's games, music has been a crucial element of the storytelling. Kingdom Hearts carries on that tradition. I tried not to use any music that already exists. My concern was to compose music that flows nicely and matches the mood. I did use some original Disney music, but tried to blend it well so that listeners would not feel awkward when my original music is mixed in. Anyway, my main concern is the flow of the music. There are 76 tracks, which is more than usual. I usually use 50 to 60 tracks. 
We use the full 100 piece orchestra to record the theme song. I guess they have to have a lot more music in a game like this because normally in a lot of RPGs you would have character themes, let's say JRPGs specifically, you have character themes or environment themes or something like that. And you're able to sort of bring these back into play repeatedly throughout the game for different themes and when characters reappear and all that kind of stuff. But if we're in a game where we're hopping between different worlds, you're going to need... Like, even if you have... Um, like the same character reappearing in a different world, the environment would be so different that having using the same theme might not be appropriate or you'd need like a lot of different music for like the battles or whatever. We're playing with Legos here? We had to ask if the developers at Square had any hints to help us through Kingdom Hearts. People just asked me questions about Aladdin yesterday like where should I go or I can't open one of the doors, etc. There are always hints hidden somewhere in the game. I personally don't like including conversation that is totally irrelevant to the story or interrupts the flow of the game. Unlike many other RPGs which let you obtain information from the same character over and over, you need to concentrate on listening to each and every word any character says in this game. Otherwise you may miss very important hints and get yourself in deep trouble. Yesterday I told the person who was looking for hints in Aladdin to remember what other characters were saying. It's a long video. In a game this deep, you'll have to keep your eyes and ears open. But if you do, I guess if you really were like nothing that's come before it, interested in anything that story. we were seeing here, and it's available now. The longer the video, the better. Wild Arms 3. Wild Arms 3. I don't... I've never played the Wild Arms game, so... Certainly not the third one. At least I don't think I have. Maybe I played a demo for one of them at some point. So I don't really have any frame of reference for this at all. games of the Wild Arms series merge the fantasy and western genres into a unique role-playing game. For the third installment, the developers at Media Vision create an entire western frontier world full of bandits and hired guns, as well as some more magical creatures, behind which looms a monumental mystery that only you can solve. The story takes place on a planet called Filgaia, which has been devastated for years. A long time ago, a civilization with advanced technology inhabited this planet, but now it's desolate and barren, with no trees or water. The inhabitants of Filgaia, including the main character... Dude, that didn't look anything like you. ...there used to be water and trees, but that one event caused the planet to die. The story begins as the main characters research the history of their dead planet and discover how beautiful it was previously. As the main character tries to find out what caused the devastation of the planet, she encounters the other stars of the game. Hi. In the prologue, the main character, Virginia, takes her father's gun to fight against demons that attack her village. After realizing how hard it is to fight against these enemies, she decides to leave her village and become an adventurer. Although the game has only one main hero, the other three characters are almost as important as the main character, since they all have their own dramas. We wanted players to understand this and sympathize with each of them. Wild Arms 3 also brings a never-before-seen graphic style to the PlayStation 2. Cell shaded. When production on Wild Arms 3 began, the cell shading style was already applied to many games. So we wanted to use a different style. We apply tone shading, which is a general term, and draw the characters' outlines to make them look like animation. There are also diagonal lines on the shading part, which change according to the direction of the light which we use to add texture and create a warm feeling to the graphics, like illustration. Therefore, we call it stroke shading. The PlayStation 2 made it easier for us to achieve this.
Not only is the look of the game different, but Wild Arms 3 also features a new combat system. The past two games use a typical RPG battle system, in which you make moves, but the opponent does not move at all. It's simple and easy. In Wild Arms 3, the movement is different. Characters and enemies can take action simultaneously. Consequently, in battles, everyone is mixed up, and players can enjoy making complex movements. Alright. Still seems kind of turn-based-y, though. The other half of your combat resources, the magic system, is based on some very Eastern concepts. This may be a Japanese way of thinking, but there is a belief system that gods live in all the elements. Fire, water, wind, and soil. In Wild Arms 3, you can incarnate them, but you have to use a different stone slate depending on the god you want to summon and use in battle. Each of the four main characters have different abilities. For example, Gallo's attack level is high because he has a high magic ability. Usually in other games, if you use magic, you lose points. But in Wild Arms, you can use magic as many times as you want during the battle. They are not only for attack, but also to enhance protection ability, lower enemies' attack ability, and so forth. We want users to battle with creative magic combinations. As high noon approaches and the guns are drawn, you may not know who is friend or foe, but one thing's for certain, Wild Arms 3 brings the adrenaline rush of the Wild West to a classic immersive RPG world, and when the dust settles, only the strong will be left standing. Oh, online gaming E3, so, uh, SOCOM and Madden, oh my god, the, um... This year at E3, the highlight of the PlayStation booth was the competition arena. Those people who were lucky enough to be at the show got to check out two amazing online-enabled games for the... SOCOM was a great game in its time. The first game was Madden Football 2003, which will make its exclusive online console debut for the PlayStation 2. There were online consoles before the PlayStation 2. The Dreamcast had online. There was Sega Channel and X-Band beforehand. There was, um... Hell, there was even, like, some Nintendo things that were online. But Sony made a pretty big uh, step up with a lot of the games that you'd seen, like... Games that were clearly based around the idea of playing online like SOCOM was. So, like, there was a... There was an EverQuest game, which... Came out for the uh, PlayStation 2. An MMORPG. Like, a true-to-life MMORPG for the PlayStation 2. Not not Final Fantasy XI. A different one. <laughs> Sean White. <laughs> but the... Um, of course, it ended up paling in comparison to what Xbox Live was for the Xbox One, or original Xbox. God, I will never get that right. For the original Xbox, just sort of did a more cohesive, um, easier to use, more user-friendly online experience. The fact that the Xbox came with its network adapter, whereas Sony had... For most versions of the PlayStation 2, you needed to buy a separate peripheral to plug into the back. In my case, I didn't. Um, my original PlayStation 2 ended up breaking, and I bought one of the later-gen models. Not the slim PS2, but the one that came with the um, network adapter. It also supposedly came with like an IR sensor, so you could use the remote without the plug-in thing, but I could never get it to work. But it was, it came with the network adapter, and that was in, I think, 2003 that I bought that version. So when I got the network adapter, I'm like, oh, oh, now I can finally play some of those games online. And it, it coincided with uh, my family getting a um, cable modem. So what's the first game I'm going to try and play? I'm going to get SOCOM. 
SOCOM was one of the few games that required high-speed internet, or what you would call high-speed internet at the time. And it was fantastic, but oh my god, it feels so clunky nowadays. I mean, I can't play it online anymore, at least not without like some third-party servers. Aftermarket servers, whatever you want to call them, hack servers. But just playing the game in single player, it feels clunky, but it was so awesome in its day. It was the first online shooter that I played, and I played it a lot. But the problem with the PlayStation 2's online connection, aside from the fact that you needed to, um, it didn't hum with the console, was that a lot of the, a lot of the, um, well, all of the games really had this really ad hoc logon system where every game you had to create a separate login, separate username, password, all that kind of stuff to log on to it. So let's say I was playing SOCOM. I would have a username and a password just for SOCOM. For EverQuest, a username and a password just for EverQuest. For Resident Evil um, Outbreak, separate logon, separate password. It was a pain in the ass. Whereas Xbox sort of unified that on all under one service name, you would log on to Xbox Live and that would be the games for every that would be the log on for every game you had there. So that's that's honestly the one feature that Sony kind of fell down on their face with. And you'd think maybe like I guess Sony didn't want to have like a lot of infrastructure back end to have something like that. So they'll just have like oh well Sony has their own server that you're expected to ping off of, but really you're going to link up with, say, the Metal Gear Solid 3 servers or the Resident Evil Outbreak servers. That's where you, and it's up to the publisher to really have a, the publisher or developer of those games to maintain their own servers. Whereas, I mean, in the PlayStation 3 era and the Xbox Live era, I think it was more brought under the first party um, server wagon. I mean, I, it's not really the case that they had, except for like MMORPGs and stuff, where they had a dedicated server where the entire game plays off of and everybody connects to that. I think a lot of it was peer to peer, but it was unified under the specific servers of Sony or Microsoft or whomever. Matt Hoffman. So, like, it, it was a, it was a great experience, but it was definitely not, definitely not really what it should have been. <laughs> Plus, it came out a l fairly late in the. I mean, not it didn't launch with the PlayStation Two. It took a couple of years or so for the PlayStation Two to get online. So it would have been nice if it was able to do it from the beginning. And it would have been nice if it was able to, like the PlayStation 2 didn't have a hard drive, so you couldn't have game updates and you couldn't have, you couldn't have system software updates. So new features couldn't be added to the PS2 after it hit market. New um, updates couldn't reach games, or if they they did, they were very limited. Like I know EverQuest Online Adventures, the MMO that I played on the PS2 that did have online updates and it would update them but it would install the updates onto the memory card and that memory card was only 8 megabytes in size so these updates had to be very small it had to be able to be something downloaded over a 56k modem it was so they're very small and a lot of bugs that existed in the game in the beginning just never got fixed and then when they they eventually like they released a sort of an expansion which unlocked a new area of the map but it was already on the disc so it just sort of unlocked an area and then there was a proper expansion which required you to just sort of purchase the game over again so you didn't download it you bought a new disc and then you ran the entire game off of that disc so I, I think it was called Frontiers or something like that. Although I, I don't think I bought that. 
I'm, I'm talking about the last freaking video. Tony Hawk. Is there a game here? <laughs> we're not looking at a game. We're just looking at X Games stuff. I guess it was... I mean, this was really popular. I mean, I don't know how popular it is now. But for a few years, X Games seems like it was going to be the next big thing. So it, I guess it's more cross promotion than anything. I see Sony was sponsoring this event here. But you'd think there would be some kind of a game tie-in. See, skateboarding and motocross. What else do we got here? BMX. Yeah. Holy shit, that looks dangerous. <laughs> oh, there's a game. Pro Skater 3, I guess, was a PS2 game. But I think um, Tony Hawk's, uh, what's it called, um, Underground, I think is what it was called, was sort of like the pinnacle of what this series was. He had the first Tony Hawk game, which everybody liked. But the second one really, like, people nowadays look at, like, oh, Tony Hawk 1 was actually crap and 2 was the great game. No, 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 no. The original was a great game, too. It just wasn't as good as the second. Second improved on it pretty much, pretty uh, significantly. 3, but Underground was the one that sort of added this kind of um, open-world-ish kind of environment that you would... Um, that was weird. <laughs> this open-ish world kind of environment that you play around in, and you jump or go run around to these different areas. It was that was a pretty big deal. But by then, like sort of the hype around Echo the Dolphin, really. <laughs> the Britney Stance beat. God, this creepy ass thing that they call Britney Spears. <laughs> It was a. It was definitely like starting to the hype behind the hype behind the Tony Hawk series was definitely starting to wane. It wasn't like the. It was a big deal, but not as big of a deal. What? <laughs> eh, whatever. What does it say? R one, R two, and Square. It's not working. <laughs> cool moves. Knockout Kings. Knockout Kings. I do not remember Knockout Kings. Obviously a boxing game. When you start your career, it doesn't matter what difficulty level you pick. What you do is go into modes. What was the... Now you can either create a boxer or select a boxer. EA Sports. What was the uh, boxing boxer. game that they're better known for? Was it Fight Night? Fight Night, what's it called? Doesn't matter what the stats are. Now, when you get ready to go... I mean, I didn't play much of it, but it was definitely, like, something people liked. Press the X button as fast as you can. I think, though, they don't make the Fight Night games anymore because EA Sports, the, this dev team, is more focused on the UFC games now. Is that Muhammad Ali? <laughs> now this doesn't matter where you are in your career or whether you Dude, have you're creeping me out right now. Just as long as you do this process at the initial startup of your system. If you mess up and Something about this guy doesn't sit well with me. Reset the system and do the process all over again. So if you have a custom character this really helps build up your stats before you get to the champ or if you have a selected character you can just have some fun. I guess the ultimate goal is to see if you're as good as me and you can beat him at the first fight of your career. But Ali at any time. Pac-Man World 2. Hi, my name is Saul and today I'm going to show you a cool move for the game Pac-Man World 2. I'm going to show you how to get unlimited lives in the level Butane Pain. Check it out. From the beginning of the level, 
Follow the intended path until you reach the first blue Bedoin. Game testers seem like a job that would Jump onto be it, like the greatest goddamn game. job in the world. Like you have to play video games all the time and you get paid for it. Make sure to hit that I think in reality though, you you're going to be playing the same game all the time. Like you're going to spend most of your time filling out TPS reports. And, here, jump back to the blue and then you're, you're just going to play the, it's like, oh well you hit a bug, well fill out this report and submit it to the uh, rest of the QA team and then you play the same thing again the next day and it's like oh my god and imagine if it's like a boring game or a hard game or something that any game really that you're going to end up playing an enormous amount it would just kill the game the gaming is a hobby for you it's like what are you going to Oh, like, oh, I'm going to go home. I'm going to play some video games? No. <laughs> it's not fun anymore. <laughs> Plus, I think you get paid shit. This will take you back to the checkpoint you just got to. Once again, from where the checkpoint was... I didn't even know they made a Pac-Man game for the PS2. This is definitely doesn't... Like, Pac-Man is a very specific game for a very specific time. And we are not looking at what Pac-Man is here. They're just trying to like cash in on the name. This doesn't feel like a or look like a Pac-Man game at all. I'm gonna see the Pac-Man character. So if at any time you get frustrated and you find that you don't have enough lives to complete a level, do the infinite live trick just like I showed you to get as many lives as you need. Feels like it would take forever though, bro. Oh, okay, Knockout Kings, we already seen that. Oh, was that it? Oh, what do you know? Half an hour, or 27 minutes for the second part of this video. Not as long as I was expecting, the last one took like two hours. Anyway, what was this? OPM issue 60, oh, that's why that trick didn't work. Because it's bulletin of uh, issue 60, not 61. Whatever. Hmm. Uh, whatever. Anyway. Official US PlayStation Magazine issue number 61. Jumping around a bit. I'll try to fill it out, but it'll take me a little while. Thanks for watching.